Hi, I am Ed Love, and I am a professor of marketing. I've been at Western for about 15 years. I'm the chair of the Department of Finance and Marketing. I teach strategy, I teach analytics, I teach innovation. Hi, I'm Dan Purdy. Uh, I'm a senior instructor of marketing here at Western Washington University. I teach um, marketing principles, marketing research, and integrated marketing communications, uh, which I've been doing for about the last 15 years or so, uh, and hope to be able to do for another 15 years or so. Thanks for having me. Hi, I'm Mark Staten. I'm the digital marketing professor at WW in the fall quarter of 2022. I'm going to say neither agree nor disagree, because uh, as people know who've taken my class, the answer to all questions in marketing is it depends. And I think that my teaching style is like some work environments, but not others. I think that one of the things that we have talked a lot about in my class with our guest speakers is the rise of remote work. And so I like to think of our class as being a fairly collaborative space, but if you're working in a, in a, at home and not really being, in, interacting with so many people, it's gonna be less representative of that. But, and I, but I think in some ways it, it, it is representative, so that's why I took the wishy-washy way of saying neither agree, agree nor disagree. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. We've had, um, I've definitely had some speakers and, you know, one of the things about Zoom that we've all seen is how it really, you know, you see inside people's homes. And and so I think that, you know, seeing the people that are their first job out of school and, and they're working in their apartment and, you know, and it, and it really feels like it, they had been working towards this idea of a career in this sort of collaborative workspace. And again, there's all these technical tools and, and, and um, you know, electronic ways that you can create community. But, it, you know, I still think it's, it's pretty hard. So when you see that, you were like, this isn't really what I thought was going to happen when people uh, did that. But everyone adjusts. Well, I think um, to start with, uh, a college class is not the same thing as a work environment. Uh, so, you know, when I am on my soapbox in front of the classroom, that's nothing like what you're going to experience. now. You know, I do try and have a, a classroom environment that's very discussion oriented. So, you know, there's lots of back and forth, but even that isn't what you're generally going to experience. You know, if there is a leader in a room, then frequently uh, the whole conversation is dictated by that person's personality. And if they're more directive, then it's not, there's not gonna be as much discussion. Now that said, there are times when I try and build in more professional kind of expectations. Uh, for example, if I'm in a room and I don't get the sense that everyone is fully ready to have the conversation about a specific case that we're talking about, then that may feel a little bit more directive. Um, and I also try and build in time uh, in my classes for group work. And I know that not all students love group work, right? I never loved group work, but you know, a group is the functional team of the workplace and you have to be comfortable with that. And so um, probably the times that you spend struggling over problems with your group is the most typical of the workplace. Let's see, I said agree. Um because I make a, an effort to create um, a simulated environment, but it is, it's not true to life. Um, a college class is not uh, a facsimile of the workplace. Um, if I expand the idea of the classroom environment a little bit beyond maybe just the, the, the lecture period or the, that you know sort of transfer of information period to the whole thing, uh, I move in increments. So at the very basic level classes, I'm focusing, focusing on trying to have some very sort of introducing them to basic uh, professional ideas. So like deadlines, to 
it's a function of professional life that you're going to have deadlines. Um, and then as we move up in difficulty through the classes, then things things sort of accelerate. And then when we get to the, the higher level classes, then I relax some of those things because that's kind of what happens in the workforce, right? Once you, once you prove at a low level that you can execute, you can get things done, you can make things happen, you get actually more uh, degrees of freedom as you move through your professional career. Um, now you still have things you have to do, don't get me wrong, right? But once you get a track record, so to speak, then people start to trust you a little bit more. And so a survey class like Marketing 380, that's very different than how I interact in IMC or Applied IMC. And 381 is kind of in the middle. Um, and that's intentional. I'm trying to simulate different elements of professional work and, and life in a way, but in no way is college and a college class like it. We're at a very different culture. Academic culture is very different than a professional culture. And then if you go from cu culture to culture in the professional world, an Amazon culture versus an IBM culture, like they're very different cultures. Um, I, I remember reading about Steve Ballmer, who was at Microsoft for years as the CEO, would, would walk into an executive boardroom and hand out a printed 11 by 17 spreadsheet without the calculations done. And he expected his executives to be able to, with a ruler, look at the numbers, do the math in their head, and have a conversation about it. Now, think about that. That is not really what we would think of as maybe a kinder, gentler environment. Then in, in the academic world, we're much, much, much on the other end of that spectrum. So you're gonna find all kinds of different types of professional environments. It would be impossible for us to simulate all of them, but I'm trying in a simple way to help students pivot from thinking like a student to thinking more like a professional would. I would say agree. I would I would say not necessarily strongly agree. I think that there uh, is a a very robust advising system. I think that there's a uh, uh, we have a very collegial faculty that wants to serve the students, but I think that the students don't always take us up on that. And so I think while I would agree in the sense that we have the resources and the, and the opportunities to do that, I would say that they're not as fully utilized as they could be. I mean, I, 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 you know, we're, we're, like I said, we're very collegial. So like our doors are open and I, and I, and I can't think of anyone who's in our department, who's not here to make our, to serve our students. And so to, to make sure that our students really feel like they're heard and that they're getting what they want out of it. And so I think that, you know, are there sort of specific events and things like that absolutely but i think it's 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 the fact that the presence that we have in parks hall together that really creates that have you seen our link tree i don't know <laughs> but i know that we have one and i know that link tree is an important thing um, i've seen the link tree and I believe that there are links from the link tree into our Instagram, our social medias, our other things that are social that I don't fully understand. Um, but if you want to get in touch with me or you want to get in touch with the department, um, you can always email us and you'll get a rapid response. I think you'll find that, that this is true, not just for, from me or from Heather, but uh, for any of our faculty that they're gonna respond to you quickly. I think that uh, more student to student communication is better and that's where the, um, uh, the Instagram and the other social media tools um, can be very helpful. Uh, the structure of SMA right now I think is very exciting because it is designed to be a great resource for all students and I applaud all of the students that have played a role in making that happen. Yeah, so a great example is the recent reception that we had for uh, members of the Marketing Advisory Board to meet with members of the Student Marketing Association. And, uh, you know, that was an event that we were able to cater thanks to um, the, uh, the resources that uh, our alumni provided through Give Day. Um, and 
at that what I what I saw at that event, the students who were plugged in and were uh, able to participate had, I think, very engaging and very helpful conversations with um, senior leaders in the field of marketing that I, I hope will um, help them to um, get ready for what's next in their lives. Yeah, so I think the, the um, probably the way I think about channels is you got high touch channels and then you've got sort of uh, self-serve channels. And uh, I think the high touch channels are personal events, um, speaking with faculty during office hours, maybe chatting after a class, things like that. Uh, I think obviously hearing from faculty in class, I think that's also important where faculty will mention things that are happening in class, that sort of thing. Um, so I think that the high touch is the faculty channel which I think is really, really important. I think we have a challenge with that because there's not very many of us. I don't know, we have five or six faculty members, I think, in the, in the program. Um, and so we have a lot of students and not as many, not as many um, individuals to do the high touch, but I think that's very effective. When students come talk to me, then I can add context, I can add layers to it, I can help them understand things. Um, and then there's more the self-serve channel, which is providing ways for students to find information for themselves. And maybe that's through social media, or maybe that's through um, uh, the website and things like that. And I think in those areas are things that we're, we're really um, starting to improve our ability to provide better information through channels that students will, um, will self-serve. And I think there are some students who feel very comfortable talking to faculty. But in my experience, there's a lot more who don't feel as comfortable. And that's what we have to sort of think about is, you know, we talk to you guys all the time about, think like the customer. Think like who you're trying to help. Um, if we think like ourselves, then it's hard for us to even vision those, right? So we have to think not just about the students who might uh, come to office hours. We love them, we want more of you guys to come, but also the students who don't. Um, I joke a lot of times that, you know, the selective universities, um, you know, they're, they're picking the best and the brightest. Those are not the people who need the most help. And the people who need the most help are the folks who aren't asking for help. And that's, we have to sort of figure out, like, how do we, how do, we do more to encourage them to feel comfortable, A, stepping up and asking, but also how do, we, how do we serve information to people who might not ever feel comfortable asking? Because the reality is they're, they're doing it in some ways. They're just doing it in ways that might not help them as much as, as they could. Disagree. So the question was asked, the majority of my students are using uh, office hours correctly. And I would say that in a given quarter, the majority of my students are not coming to my office hours. So uh, that's why I said that. I think that the students that do come at office hours are getting a lot out of it. And I certainly get a lot out of talking to them. But I think that if there's one thing that I've definitely noticed over the years of, of, of being here and being in higher ed is, is a sort of a hesitancy among a lot of students to attend office hours, not really understanding what office hours are for, uh, intimidating, you know, an intimidation factor towards going. So I think we need to do a better job of explaining what office hours are for and, and, and try to encourage more people. I mean, I said in class this quarter, I was like, I really like it if every single one of y'all came and that hasn't happened. So, um, so uh, you know, I think that we, I, I would, I, I, I wish office hours were used more. They got jobs. Um, they, they did better in class. Um, they, uh, they definitely, um, you know, they, 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 they saw me as, you know, we, 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 we became less a faculty uh, student relationship and more a friend relationship and and you know I, I would say that most of the students that I'm still keeping in touch with you know I, I, I just had a uh, you guys remember Emily Reninger yeah I just like, like had a half an hour uh, zoom chat with her from Mexico and you know I know that she's a student that you know she graduated probably eight years ago and uh, and sh and she's a student that would have come by my office hours so like you know I think that 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 those connections are really hard, are harder to make within the class. Those long-term connections are much easier to make in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Oh, no. Yeah, um, 
I think that, you know, number one, the idea of the majority of students, I would say that, um, you know, there, certainly not a majority of students are coming to office hours, and oftentimes the ones that do aren't use, utilizing them to their fullest effect. Uh, I, I do have quite a few students who come to office hours. Uh, I think um, it is rarely a day that I don't have one or two come in um, for, for something. But I think out of a, I have typically anywhere from 100 to 200 students a quarter. And I'll see 40 or 45 in, during, a, during a quarter, max, okay? So we're talking less than a third probably. And oftentimes what I see is the same people will come again and again and again and again. Um, and so I think there's a tremendous opportunity for students to meet faculty on a different level and to get to know them in a different way. And I think that what we can learn is that relationships take time and they're, they need energy, they need attention and stewardship. And so if, if students want to cultivate relationships, number one, there's the, the relationship benefit of doing so, that you, you get a relationship. But I think even more important than that is learning how to, because this is tip of the iceberg stuff, right? This is beginning of your career. You're gonna have to do this throughout your career. And it takes time and energy, it takes empathy, it takes patience. People in your professional world and in your, in, in your world in general are not always gonna do things that you appreciate or that you agree with. Well, how do you work through those things? How do you get to know them and have empathy and gain trust even when maybe decisions don't fall the way you want them to? And I think you can start learning that here. Now, the challenge is, is that we're a scarce resource. So you can't just do it with one. You have to think about practicing with different. So I encourage students, you know, set yourself an objective. You've got four professors in a quarter. You know, you've got 10 weeks. What if you visited each one twice? You know, well, now you're getting eight people, right? And then maybe it's three times, you know, um, maybe you have to wait in line, maybe you don't. But I think if you can meet them, you can practice some of these skills, you start to build a different kind of skill set. You also build a different kind of relationship, which is exactly the kind of relationship you're going to have to build with your boss, which is, it's not exactly friends, but it can be very friendly. Um, it needs to be professional. It needs to be growth oriented. Um, but if you can learn how to show that supervisor, that you're interested, whew, man, you can make an ally. And then a lot of the things that are like 50-50, which way is it gonna fall? It starts falling your way. Why is it falling your way? Is it luck? No, it's diligence on your part to build a relationship so that you start getting in the benefit of the doubt versus the other way. And the other thing that happens is because they know more about what's going on with you, they can understand more. Because when you don't know in a vacuum why that student's not coming to your class, why they're not turning things in on time, like why, what, do you, what assumptions might you make? As a student, you're leaving that up to guess and chance work. What if they, they would give you the benefit of the doubt because they believe that even though maybe you're not doing things perfectly, that you have good intent? Professors are human beings too, right? You got to understand as a marketer, the human psychology and experience so that you can help people. That starts with helping yourself by understanding how people think and how they do things. You, you learn that here, you'll be light years away uh, ahead of your colleagues and competitors out there from UW and WSU and other places who they're going to spend the first 10 years of their career, maybe longer, learning that. How do you learn it in 10 months so you don't waste 10 years figuring that out? That was a spectacular. Well, I think it's true in, um, in every course I teach. Um, I, uh, you know, I think that you can see it in, in marketing analytics, certainly. Uh, when I teach a class in front of a classroom, I'm teaching to that whole class. And I do my best to um, address individual struggles or problems within that classroom environment. And I usually take a question that one student has as a signal that there's, there's a missing connection that a lot of students are feeling, right? Um, but when a student comes and meets with me individually in a classroom, there's an opportunity for me to directly address the learning challenges 
that an individual student has. And that can be incredibly productive. So it's time that I'm happy to spend um, working through particular blocks, you know, be it on regressions or what have you. Now, something else happens because of that. The, that student has sent a signal to me that, uh, that they are very interested in the topic and that they want to work to be better. Um, and that they also are interested in how I can support them in that. And so a relationship does develop. And when the time comes for me to provide a letter of recommendation, it's much easier for me to do that for those students. And um, I naturally find myself in a position where I want to be a champion for that student. So at this stage of my career, I have a very useful network for my students. And so having me as a champion for them, um, I think is a really valuable thing. Not enough of my students take advantage of that. Um, and, you know, I, I, and this is all sort of complements to the points that Dan has already made because he's absolutely 100% right. The skills that you learn by um, going and meeting with faculty members on an individual basis are skills that are going to translate and advance your career in, in ways that you may not perceive right now. Um, the relationships, the closest relationships that I have with alumni are with the alumni who did take the time to meet with me individually. We appreciate you.